I'm Anne Marie McDonald. Welcome to a special edition of Doc Zone. What really happened on June 23rd, 1985? When Air India Flight 182 blew up, all 329 aboard were killed. Most of the victims were Canadian. The crime led to our legal system's longest ever investigation. Using CSIS wiretaps, transcripts, and interviews, acclaimed director Sterla Gunnarsson presents a chilling account of the worst mass murder in Canadian history. Air India 182, without commercial interruption. I was an air traffic controller working in the air traffic control centre at Shannon Airport. The last transmission I made to flight Air India 182 was Squawk Alpha 2005. That was the last transmission made and received on frequency. There was one fleeting moment on the tape where there was a loud, long, continuous noise, but no voice. India 182 Shannon I'm transmitted on three or four occasions Air India 182 Shannon do you read Air India 182 Shannon Unfortunately I received no reply on my frequency so, India 182 has gone off the scope Where'd you last have him? Uh, 269 of No one to this day has ever determined whether it was static or the aircraft in trouble trying to transmit to me. To this day, we don't know. My grandmother was ill. My father wanted to go see her before she had passed. The whole world here. Oh, there's another one going over there. Look at that. He wanted to definitely see his mother. But at the time, something didn't seem right. My father had never gone anywhere leaving us behind before. Like, anywhere. It's just, at that time, I don't know what it was, but it didn't seem right. Something didn't seem right. You know, even his friends were saying, like, there's a lot going on in India, you know, just be careful. Ardial Johor, he was well known at the temple. I remember him. I remember meeting him. When they asked him, you know, how come you're here, are you flying? You know, it was quite early in the morning, I believe, and he didn't really have an answer. 
and just kind of like you know moved on walked away and that was it the father was quite concerned I believe he purchased an additional four hundred thousand dollars life insurance he was concerned because he knew that Hardy Old Joe Hall was a Babar Khalsa member. And it is a militant Sikh extremist organization. At that time, uh, Babar Khalsa was uh, announcing uh, the fact that uh, planes would fall from the sky, uh, Air India planes would fall from the sky, and uh, warn people not to uh, travel with uh, Air India aircraft. the Indian government and their security forces mounted Operation Blue Star, targeted at the Golden Temple in Amritsar. And the Indian government's actions around that particular event had, a, had an effect of galvanizing overseas Sikh communities everywhere, and, and particularly what we, we term the Sikh extremist communities. Those individuals among the Sikh communities that held to the notion of a separate state of Khalistan. People were very angry. Loved ones may have been killed, temple was interfered with. So people were susceptible to the kind of uh, preaching that went on, which was essentially for a violent response to the government of India. I think it's fair to say that the principal extremist or pro-Khalistani group at that time would have been the Barbara Khalsa. And it was widely understood that Talwinder Singh Parmar was the leader of the Barbara Khalsa in Canada. Talwinder Parmar was assigned a very high level of investigation, the highest we had at the time. So the profile would have been, um, in accordance with our assessment, that, that Talwinder Singh Parmar represented us, his activities represented a very serious threat to the security of Canada. Was there uh, an appreciation that we are dealing with a terrorist organization here who has killed, or which has killed? Yeah, yeah that was understood. were checked through to New Delhi and he said I'm not he says I, I phoned them this morning I'm confirmed on Air India I said you may be confirmed on their computer but you're not confirmed on our computer but it's not on our computer when you get to Toronto check in with Air India oh no what do you mean when I leave in Toronto I have to pick up my luggage take my luggage to the Air India and rebook it yes oh no it's a big hassle for me I paid full fare for the ticket I understand sir but you need to come he did say I paid full fare for my ticket, and he was a business class passenger in the business class lineup, which gives him privileges. Okay, okay, here. It's okay. You know what? I'll take care. And I did change the baggage tag to read Toronto, Montreal, Delhi on Air India. Thank you. Have a safe flight. 
Unfortunately, that's one of the things in my life that I see in slow motion all the time is me ripping off the orange Toronto baggage tag and putting on the pink interline tag, which would transfer it over to Air India. Ray is a tightly wound guy. Ray is living this file. This investigation is not a nine to five thing for Ray Cobsey. This is his life. Knowing Ray, Ray was going crazy at this time because we had a finite number of resources and there was intense competition between operational branches for those resources. It sounds trite to say that it was a very busy time for our counterterrorism program, but that's the fact of the matter. Ray was deeply concerned that if he could not investigate Tal Winder Singh Parmar to the depth that he needed to investigate, he was going to do something. There was a lot of toing and froing a day or two before because, of course, we were trying to actively get them on that flight. You know, they weren't originally booked on the connecting CP flight to make Flight 182. It's just so awful to think of it now. I can remember my aunt using a phrase, oh, it's just heartbreaking now. You know, it's a, it's a, a saying in, in Islam, inshallah, if it be the will of Allah. You know, inshallah, we'll meet again. We were sisters. Zeb was always happy and adored by all of us. She was starring every way. Yes, yes, she was. And at the same, same time, she will never tell anybody that she's a doctor. Unless it comes up or anything, she was the most humble person I know. And I remember my mom just not letting my aunt go. They just kept touching each other's hands through the glass. I really remember that. Just smile. And feeling frustrated, uh, feeling embarrassed, you know, and just saying, okay, bye to my aunt and uncle. And we, we never. It just wouldn't even occur to us that we'd never see them again, ever. The last time I saw my father was after checking in. I remember this one part where you, you check in and then you go to the gate and then when you're leaving from the gate, You walk. <clears throat> There's this part you walk and you can see everybody walk into the airplane. I just remember my dad waving. This is a final boarding call for passenger and safe on flight. That was the last time he waved goodbye, that's all I remember. When she left, I was very restless, just almost suffocating. 
In a flash, I saw my sister, her hands outstretched like that. And it was just, it was so real what she was wearing when she left. I just saw her there, stretched her arms. stages of a plan. It's the nature of the terrorist beast that the plan has not crossed the line into criminality. If you look at the activities that go into mounting a terrorist organization, apart from conspiracy, those activities are benign in the extreme. And unless the intelligence that you have or the criminal intelligence that you have contains a degree of specificity, that conspiracy doesn't have a hope in hell of passing muster in a criminal court. So fundamentally, you have to let these conspiracies run a long way before you make intervention. I call this the 60 minutes to boom phenomenon. When you are leading a counterterrorism investigation, you effectively have to take a terrorist conspiracy 60 minutes to boom to have a realistic shot at a successful prosecution. And that's just the way it is. We didn't know what that bang was. We didn't know if it was a report of a rifle um, or a detonation. Um, and there were some conflicting assessments around that by the people that heard it. Was the bang in the bush in Duncan? Was that our 60 minutes to boom and we missed that opportunity? Borsha Kelly it was accepted to do her PhD at a university in India and that's why she was going back I was you know your typical Canadian kid I always I was born here and raised here and just your average Canadian teenager you know my mom actually said you should come to India with me and you'll have the whole summer we can just bum around India but something inside me knew that I shouldn't run away from my problems, so I, I didn't go, which, you know, gladly, thankfully, I didn't go. I remember I had to go to work and saying goodbye to her at the door, and I remember her saying that she would be back before I knew it, and... And she used to say to me and my sister, you know, I'm in the prime of my life. She used to say that at 48, you know, this is the prime of my life. Oh, Ray, oh, is that you, Doug? <laughs> How's it going under here? Oh, good, good. When I first met Inderjeet Rayat, he was working my truck. Yeah. 
fun and to be very personable fella. Perfect timing. So it's giving me a lot of trouble. I was a corporal on the Duncan General Investigation Section, and I received a phone call from Ray Cobsey, and he told me that he was with CSIS. To be honest, at that time, uh, CSIS had just formed, and uh, I had to do a bit of thinking to bring out what CSIS was in my mind, which I did, and uh, his inquiry was uh, to do some discreet background checks on Inderjeet Rayat. Inderjeet Rayat seemed to me like a nice family man. I had five children, I believe he had four children. Seemed to have a lot of the same goals in life and whatnot, and we just uh, seemed to be one of those deals where we got along well with each other. Uh, personalities sort of clicked and we had some good conversations. And uh, as the investigation started to unfold, I certainly started to see a different person. Uh, it was certainly not just for myself, but for all police agencies in, in this country. It was, uh, it was a, a, a learning curve about terrorism and, and uh, what a terrorist is really like. We started to towards Toronto. It was raining like anything, storm coming. We were fighting quite a bit. And that didn't make any sense why we were fighting. Anu was just uh, kept on saying, I know that, that uh, we are going and you're going to be alone. With a kid, did not understand that. And even truthfully saying, Captain Law, even I don't understand that, why it was happening. Uh, maybe God wants us to be angry enough that uh, we started hating each other. If something happens, we don't love. I don't know. In this group of associates that Talman or Parmar had, you had a bunch of like-minded individuals who got together and plotted actions and planned for the future of Khalistan. You're talking about Hardy El Johal, Surgeon Singh Gill, Inerjit Rayat, Raputam and Malik, all of the names that have surfaced in the context of the Air India conspiracy. When we talk about his close circle of contacts, that's who we're talking about. Raputa bin Malik, to the extent that there was a money guy associated with BK, Raputa bin Malik was that guy. To bring life to the Barber Khalsa and to support terrorist activities of the Barber Khalsa, Malik was a good candidate to go into that role. Najab Singh Bagri is uh, Babar Khalsa leader. His views on achieving an independent Khalistan are very similar to uh, Malik's. <laughs> These are very bellicose individuals. There was not a day that went by when Sikh extremists were not going to kill somebody or blow something up. There were many instances where people spoke up and they were threatened, physically manhandled, and they changed their stance the next day. It was a, a state of fear that, uh, that existed in the community at that time. People have uh, 
phoned me and said they're going to liquidate me. Uh, that's the political jargon. Uh, they will reform me. That's the, what they've been saying literally in Punjabi, which means they will kill me. I felt and others felt that the government of the day, the political establishment of the day, and even the law enforcement establishment, not the people on, on the beat, on the, on the ground, but the, the actual established leadership, did not feel uh, that there was a problem, that, you know, here were some brown guys, some with turbans, others without turbans, killing each other or hurting each other or making fiery speeches uh, about something that was 15,000 miles away. It didn't affect anybody else in the society. It doesn't matter. Just as we were approaching the airport, the rain stopped. I was very worried. I said, you know, with this storm and all, taking, like, the f planes going up, out and all that. And my husband said, we, what time are you living in? He said, these, these type of, this type of rain doesn't bother the big airplanes. But it just felt very comforting that everything had cleared up. It was a beautiful day. It was not an extremely busy day, which sometimes you can get busy, busy periods in the international flights. This was a, this was a nice day. Okay. You're gonna go to school. And there, in your gates just that way. School was out, and these were all Canadian children that were going home to meet with the grandparents or go home for their summer holiday. A lot of young people. It was entirely their decision because they thought they were old enough to travel on their own and connect with the family entirely on their own. My oldest son, Devin, had written on his calendar, return to homeland, you know, a little uh, thing on the 23rd of June. Yeah. We had two very talented young daughters, and my life revolved around my family. It was our, our hope that, you know, they would grow up to be really uh, productive, good, good Canadians. There was this odd coincidence about all five young women being dancers traveling together and Vishnu was going to be this one chaperone of these five young women and we teased him about it and we, he, he kept saying I'm gonna get a seat so far away from these five boisterous young women you know so that I can travel in peace we traveled always together this was one of the first times that we weren't all together You have what a great color. There was one young girl that came up. She was dressed in blue. She was, I, I think, probably 22 years old. And she said, it's my first trip over there, and I really want it to look so nice. So we assured her that she looked so beautiful. And the safety of Mr. Gandhi without the support from headquarters. But, well, with all due respect, sir, we have an emergent situation taking place here in the field. So, so, the Lord, Corolla. You look good. I take an eye. Phone the volume, Marco.
So if you're Ray Kobzi, you know, you breathe a sigh of relief, you say, finally, and you start hoping and praying that what derives from resources that he now has will in some way advance your investigation beyond where it was before you got that resource allocated to you. The more sources that you have working against the target, the greater the prospect that you're going to find that critical nugget, that, that very valuable singular piece of intelligence, actionable intelligence, if you will. He's now got a critical mass of information is starting to come together, pointing to the fact that the Barbara Kelsey in Canada is planning something. everything about him. He looked very, very handsome in uniform, uh, a tall, very handsome uh, Sikh gentleman, and uh, very fit to look at, very intelligent. He was very ambitious. His friends always thought that one day he will be the managing director of Air India with his uh, qualifications, his background, and his intelligence. There is no one like him. We are saying bye. We hug each other. And I'm telling the kid, take care of your mom. On the same time, I'm telling the mom, take care of the kids. This is the first time that a person is going uh, uh, out of country and uh, I'm not there with them. And I turn around and uh, see from the other side there was another line standing for British Airways. Surprisingly, there were almost 80% uh, people with a turban. And I asked that friend of mine, how come that all the six are over here? And uh, they were not in Air India. The only two people went to Air India. Why? He said, you know that the sick people have bycarded Air India. I wanted to see my family at that minute. Something was pushing me to see them. I do not know what to do. Uh, they won't let me in. And I dread that moment. I let them go. One of the things that does stand out in my mind about this investigation is the piece of evidence where Mr. Rayet went to the store. He had the battery, the relay, and I believe it was a light of some type, and the time clock. When it went off at the set time, it blinked. And his goal was to have a solid beacon instead of the blinking beacon. So I just picture in my mind this fellow walking in the store that's as evidence suggests, building a bomb walking into the store with this contraption and uh, asking these questions and help to do this. Ready? Perfect. Certainly, that's one of the things I really recall, and it's uh, 
it's just unusual for for somebody doing that caliber of crime to the to do that. So you want a few sticks? Yes, please. Yeah. Let's Canadian police agencies. We were in our infancy as far as terrorism investigations. Police officers at the time. I mean, yes, Canada has our great Canadian mosaic today. Back in 1985. Um, uh, I don't think the police were any different in East India. I mean, we, we didn't know the difference between uh, what is what is what is a Punjabi, what is Sikh, what is Hindu, uh, Khalistan. What is that? Where's India? Like, here you have a conspirator walking around and telling people about his concerns back in India, and he has to do something, and very overtly doing things, which is laying in an, an evidentiary trail. At that time, the assets and interests of the government of India occupied the highest threat level that we had. What do you do? Unless you have intelligence that says specifically these individuals associated with this organization intend to place a bomb constructed in this fashion on this aircraft leaving Toronto on this day and at this time, what can you do? It was really, really hectic in there. And there was a lot of pressure on those people. Get things moving, get it moving. We've got to get that plane in the air. Load the luggage on and on your way. Most airlines don't like to see one of their aircraft just sitting idle. Sanjay is the older one, and he was very gentle. His teachers describe him as a holy man. My younger one, Deepak, was bright too. He too was an honor student, but he was full of life, full of laughter, full of mischief. They used to say, I have two hands, one's Sanjay, one's Deepak. I have two eyes, one's Sanjay and one's Deepak. One has got foresight and the other one is the light of my life because Deepak means light. He was born on Diwali. Deepak said bye and then that's it. He went off straight with the kids. He was laughing, jumping, running. Wait for me, guys. And Sanjay came to me and said, Mom, look after Dad. Sanjay said this and then he went forward, said goodbye, went forward, said goodbye. He turned back 20 times before he turned off. The kids and all had, the kids were ahead of him and they went away and the lady went with them. But this son of mine turned back 20 times and then I began to feel agitated and I said, Babu, what is this? This is not normal. concerns that the uh, Babar Khalsa may orchestrate some type of a plot to uh, either assassinate uh, Rajiv Gandhi or, or cause him harm. So that was a meeting done by the RCMP and the uh, security service in the States. I know nothing. To see if they would tell them anything uh, concerning what they knew about uh, certain individuals and uh, also to, uh, to let them know that uh, they were being watched.
the machine was broken down on that day. So the bags could not pass through the scanner. Everybody come here. Everybody. The security guy came downstairs and uh, explained to the security people what they should do and gave them a hand bone to check the uh, suitcases. The security manager, he lit a match and he passed the bone on top and then he came beep. That's the noise you look for. Now take this and use this one. That was only the once, first time I've seen in 25 years that they used the wand downstairs to scan bags. children on board the flight and uh, this is the most vivid memories I have personally the one that keeps coming back is uh, the little girl uh, she couldn't have been more than seven and she was clutching a big box of chocolates and I can still see that little face joking with her all the way to the gate that you better give me that box of chocolate because they're going to be melted before we get there. Oh no, oh no sir, oh no, oh no, I'll keep them. See Pierre, good afternoon. While Air India travels, Toronto, Delhi via Montreal, I can put you on a non-stop flight. Air India 182. The uh, wiretaps consisted of Tolwinder Singh Parmar right up until June 23rd, 1985. That was a major problem uh, for the CSIS at that time to have enough resources to translate the tapes that they had intercepted, to have them translated uh, quickly and, and properly. What does that mean to you as a reasonable man? Have you written the story yet? The fact that something I don't understand is followed by a call to a CPR office does not present to me a eureka moment saying, oh my God, they bought tickets for a CPR flight and they're going to put a bomb on that plane. That, that doesn't follow in any reasonable man's reality. You know, so that, that's the eyes that, that we're looking at this with. Um, have you written the story? What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, Air India Flight 182, destination Delhi via Montreal and London Heathrow, will now commence pre board We would ask anyone traveling from small children or anyone else needing assistance to board at this time. Please When the back came down, the guy went with the scanner. So it came beep, beep in the center. And then uh, he turned around to the girl who was in charge, security girl. 
So she said, that's okay, she says. He looked at me and I, he did this, so I did this also, you know. So I lifted that bag, I put it on a cart. I strongly feel they should have checked that one bag. sense of relief but it's very short-lived you say okay Gandhi lives to fight another day <laughs> but there's still something else going on there and we need to know what it is so you don't see a lot of celebration in our business you go back to square one and you say well it wasn't that it had to be something else Okay, if it's not Gandhi, then what? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We apologize for our delay. Welcome aboard Air India, Flight 182. En route to New Delhi via Montreal and London Heathrow. do to bodies. I've seen what falling from great heights will do to a human body. Um, I've seen what burning flesh looks like and, uh, and smells like. This is not an ethereal concept. People die and nobody should ever lose sight of the fact that if you make mistakes there can be tragic consequences. You need to remember that all the time um, because it galvanizes you it makes you personalize your investigations and it makes you do everything that you possibly can to make sure that people don't die asked to do which was to put on a certain amount of weight so I could uh, be rewarded with a weekend pass so I could attend my sister's funeral uh, sister's funeral <laughs> graduation you know we were just having some parting words and some joking around oh it was a big hug definitely yeah and you know you sort of and after sight you think oh you know why didn't i say i love you or i didn't you know there are certain things that uh, you know you remember very vividly very very clearly you can't forget them and this, of course, is one of the because you know it's uh, it's not really kind of it didn't I, I didn't think of it you know that this might be the last time I'm you know, I'm seeing them. I I didn't want them to go. I I did feel like she was abandoning me. I think. And. Uh, I, 
I just remember that she was very excited to leave, and she was very happy. The last thing she said to me was, be strong. Be strong like your sister. To Shannon. Air India 182 Shannon, do you read? There's an Air India 182 at this time. He's not talking to us. Can you see anything ahead of you there? Air India 182 Shannon, do you read? 
tree and I saw a piece of a contrail out the left side uh, that looked like it might have been a 31, but certainly no oil plane hit. We don't see anything there? At this time, we're very worried. We're very worried. We tried every means humanly possible to re-establish contact with the aircraft. Unfortunately, it was not to be. Air India Flight 182 is now missing. The phone had awakened my sister and I, and, and we were sort of groggy. It was very early on a Sunday morning, a beautiful, quiet Sunday morning in June, and suddenly my mom's screaming, screaming. Oh, it was a scream, really, like I've never heard. Like, it was just awful. I don't think I'll ever forget those screams. No, I know I won't. We're still very much hoping that someone's still alive and that we're going to see someone who, even if they're not waving, looks like they're alive and possibly able to be rescued. And we're still desperately hoping that someone's going to have got out of this, because sometimes people do. That's a pretty slim hope, but that is the big hope. He said to me, he said, it's the boy's flight. And I said, what happened to the flight? And he said, they're saying that it disappeared and there are no survivors. And I said, I can't be. I said, that can't be. It was a bit of an adventure, to be honest. It was. You know, we had, uh, certainly I had this mental image of this small aircraft floating on the sea and people standing on the fuselage sort of thing and we would roll up and pluck them all from the sea into safety. He went to the phone, he said, yes, yes, the children were on the plane and he says, all's gone and collapsed. And I got out of the bed and said, don't cry like a lady, like a girl, you know. I said that and I ran to the television, turned it on. Programs normally seen at this time have been canceled or rescheduled so that we may present the following CBC News special. It's one of the worst air disasters ever, and it's taken more Canadian lives than any other crash in history. Air India Flight 182 simply disappeared from radar screens off the coast of Ireland. On board were 329 people. More than 280 of them were Canadians. At least 86 of the passengers were children. It is almost certain that no one survived. You're in the near Atlantic in a 10-ton helicopter that's creating an awful lot of rotor wash. It's extremely noisy, smelly, and vibrates a lot. And yet you get this incredible feeling of it's quite calm and peaceful and eerie that there are an awful lot of people who've just died here. And it's something that I've never felt before and something that I've never felt since. Um, and I think that was just like us realising that this was going to be a recovery as opposed to a rescue operation. He had a lot of sadness on his face, and uh, he said there is an accident of 182. So straightway I asked him, is it on the ground or in the air? He said, in the air. And I still remember my words. I said, I'm finished. That was what straightway came out of my mind, at my mouth, and uh, this is how I felt. And at that stage, they told us that the wreckage extended for between five and ten nautical miles in any direction from our position. 
So we were looking at 100 square miles at least of, of wreckage. The enormity of this thing was starting to sink in. Everybody was just hoping for the best at that time. As soon as my dad's friends started coming, relatives started coming, I realized that there's something was definitely something was wrong. Nobody actually really told me what happened. I, I kind of pieced it together. As far as you could see, it was, it was wreckage. You could smell the aviation fuel. And for a, a brief time, the smell of recent death was even stronger than the smell of the aviation fuel. I was in such complete shock. You know, this it, it just felt like a dream, a nightmare that was passing me. You know, it was something that I kept feeling I'll wake up from. And it wasn't until the first body came in where the impact hit. So it was extensively injured. It was the body of, of, of a woman and she was really badly injured. There was an immediate impact on some of the men in the boat. And some of them were, were crying and some being sick. The news was coming when they were already uh, taking out the bodies. I just made a statement. I said, don't worry about that. The, the plane fell there. Uh, I know they are no swimming. So no big deal of that. And they will swim. came down with this infant in his arms and it was just terribly wrong that this infant that looked perfect was so cold and so without life and, and so out of place you know you, you don't see babies on ships um, you don't see babies on the deck of ships in the middle of the Atlantic and when you do they're supposed to be um, warm and alive. And he said, Ishe, there's been a crash. That was when I knew they were dead. I knew, I knew it, I knew it. I knew they were dead. We weren't trying to recover wreckage as such, but there was this container and I was just amazed to find that there were sweets and a chocolate bar in there with little tooth marks in it. And it's just so demoralising, really. It's just... It just wipes you out, you think. You know, there's just no hope. <laughs> no hope for anybody. We've got this, and yet there's nobody going to be alive, and it's just so tragic. It was absolutely breathtaking to see such a sad scene, really. Well, I always remember the sadness I felt in my heart when that boat was coming up the river. I, and it quite uh, apprehensive of what I may see and would I be able for this.
we lay them on the stretchers and I called teams and the nurse and the Garda and the Navy carried each stretcher. You know, it was very blustery that day, actually. As I remember the nurses had to put their hand across the stretcher to make sure that it was steady. And to me, it gave the image, you know, you're all right, you're home, we're caring for you. It had been a hard day's work. A tough job it had to be done, but you'd done it. But the impact uh, of it all, uh, the enormity of it, was uh, that night when I saw the, the news in Dublin. And I, I, I wept, I went to my cabin and wept. The Canadian authorities who are investigating the Air India plane crash have been faced today with one central question. Was there a link between that and the bomb which exploded at Narita Airport in Japan at around the same time yesterday morning? Yes, there is still they can answer that. They'll be on the flight recorder hasn't been found. The bodies which have been recovered so far have Suddenly been Suddenly it disappeared injured, from air traffic control radar control. screens. It is now suspected, though not confirmed, that a bomb blew the plane apart. Ray has spent a long time and many hard hours trying to advance this investigation. He comes into the office on a day in June 1985 and 331 human beings have been murdered in cold blood. Like, what do you think Ray Cobsey is thinking? But Ray, probably more than anybody, is saying it didn't have to happen. And that pushes anybody close to the brink of insanity. Uh, I'm not saying Ray was insane, but you can just imagine the mindset you'd be in, wondering whether there was something that he could have done or somebody could have done to have prevented this. There were a lot, a lot of people that had met the same fate as my wife. You know, they were the same relatives there. And there they were looking at me and they were saying, the Sikhs did it. And I was one of the persons that was wearing a turban. And it was uh, quite a tying moment there. And if people saying, you guys did it, you guys did it. And, uh, and I had to tell them that I lost my wife too. We were the first ones to arrive and uh, there were no Canadians. And when we went to the Indian consulate people, they said, what citizens you are? We said, we are Canadian citizens. They said, you have to wait for the Canadian people to help you out. And when we went to Ireland, there was no Canadian representative. Nothing no, at all. no. And I think that was the beginning of my rage, really, started in the days after the bombing. Uh, I remember um, then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney sending his condolences to the Indian government, which was such an outrage to me because, you know, my mother was a Canadian citizen, I'm a Canadian born in this country, and yet his condolences are going to India. It's like we were never Canadians in the first place. You know, that this was not something that happened to people that lived in our country. It was a mammoth undertaking. During the initial uh, stay with the, uh, the task force in uh, 1985, I, um, I wasn't aware that uh, uh, CSIS had uh, information or intelligence uh, concerning the uh, Babar Khalsa's involvement 
in the, uh, the bombings. It was primarily the bomb that went off in uh, Narita, Japan, that provided most of the forensic evidence for the task force to pursue. There were hundreds of police officers uh, working on the case. As a result of the evidence that they uncovered, the RCMP task force in Vancouver were able to uh, determine that the bomb maker was from uh, the Vancouver Island area. As the investigation unfolded, we found that in a very short time period before the baggage was put on the plane, Energeet Rayet went to Auto Marine Electric here in the Lower Mainland and needed to purchase another battery, took some of the components into the store and uh, sought to use his employee discount at the time he was in the Auto Marine store. When we determined that he purchased a Sanyo tuner, I think that's when, when it really hit me. Like, like I had an open mind, yes. Maybe some part of me was saying, oh, could this really be? When I determined that he purchased that Sanyo tuner, I thought, there's too much here now. This is, uh, this is the man in my mind. They took us right to the hospital in Cork where all the bodies were being brought in. They gave us some forms from Interpol to fill out as best as we could to describe our family members. Any noticeable birthmarks or, or scars and anything that could help them in the identification process. Because we didn't know at that point um, what condition the bodies were brought up. Because, you know, even in my mind at that time, I'm thinking, well, maybe he. He hit the water, uh, was unconscious, woke up, and he's, he's, he's somewhere, you know, wandering around, doesn't know where he is. Like, I mean, you think you grasp at all sorts of crazy ideas, thinking that they're still alive. We were taken to a hospital where they were doing the autopsies and where they were collecting the bodies and we were all gathered into a room. We were sort of reassured that the deaths were instantaneous and no one was really conscious of what was happening and, um, and that what they were going to do was show pictures of the bodies uh, that they had recovered. They had taken mug shots of all of the people and posted it behind this curtain. I was able to identify my sister. It didn't look like my sister. Uh, it, her face was flattened and her, her nose was gone. But I, I was able to identify her because she had a particular way of wearing her eyeliner. And that eyeliner was still on her face. <laughs> there was no external damage. There was nothing kind of, you know, to show from outside you know, that uh, there was anything violent that had happened to them. It was kind of, you know, as if they're just asleep or something. And their face was, it was fear. It was just like, they were, they had this, something had happened. They were like, this is mortified. And it was like frozen right there. The picture was just full of these. I couldn't, I couldn't have burned to see their, their bodies. It was just. Sexy. 
I wish to ensure that you understand that we do not want to threaten you. We don't want to harm you. We're not going to retaliate against you or your family or anybody else. Okay? Like you related to me before that in India when they take you in for the police station, they beat you up and stuff like that. Well, I want you to understand that we don't do that. I, I know that. Okay, you shouldn't, I don't want you to feel threatened I, in any I'm way. I'm not threatened, you know. I'm just like, you know, I'm really shocked. You know, when you say you're under arrest, like, I, I'm just really shocked, you know, like, shit. Like, I was mystified that this man that I thought was a certain type of person was now this type of person. And going, going through the interrogation, he still remained, uh, this would be hard to explain, he still remained a very nice, cordial, believe it or not, likable person. Uh, but at the same time, admitting to you that, that he did get dynamite, that he did uh, purchase the Sanyu tuner and... I don't believe for a second that, 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 that you're such an awful person, mm -hmm. okay? I know you did some bad stuff, and I want you to be honest with me, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, know, I know when you're lying to me. You and Mr. Parmer went into the woods. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell me what you did when you went into the woods, sir? We just went on walk, okay? Okay, but there was a loud noise. What was that? Well, what loud noise? What, what are you Well, that's what I just about? asked you. I didn't want you to repeat the question. I asked you what? What made the loud noise? What? How can I do it? How do I know? Okay, that's what I'm asking you. What? was the loud noise. What, I, I know nothing, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know. Listen, Ria, I want you to be honest with me, okay? I want you to think about a lot of things, and I want you to be as honest. As nice as they are, as nice as they seem, they, there's a total lack of emotion when it comes to what's being investigated. The fact that 329 people, two others were murdered, the fact that there was little kids, the fact that we produced evidence out of the sea, like little cabbage patch dolls, uh, clothes off in infants and stuff that, as an investigator, just looking at the exhibits, almost bring tears to your eyes, um, have no effect on, on, uh, on these terrorists' people. Like have absolutely no effect whatsoever. Just totally numb to it all. We found out that they loved flowers, the Indian people. I sent word out to the people of Cork had they flowers. And even little school children came into the front of the hospital with little bouquets of flowers for the children that were victims in that crash. It's a small village, and when they saw 329 people and families coming there crying, they were deeply moved. They opened their homes and their hearts, and if it was not for them, I don't know. I don't think I would have even made anything of my life. I keep on looking. Every day was worse than other. Surprisingly, I see my son. He was just sleeping. He looked like a little weaker. That's it. But just a very peacefully sleeping. Then my husband said, you're a doctor, you go. I said, no, you have to come with me. And then I saw the body. Of course, it was nothing like how we sent him. I clung to this body. I started looking at every birthmark he had. It was hysterically showing the guard the head, and he said, Relax, ma'am, this kid will be given to you. So we found Sanjay. 
but I never found Deepak. And I went looking for every bone that they had there. <laughs> He's, I never haven't found him. And for a long time, I used to think, maybe he saved, maybe he'll, he'll come one day to Canada and I'll find him. But the scientist in me doesn't, didn't believe such stupidity. No, I don't know that I'm getting happy get angry or get sad. Because when you come out, you hear the voice from the people. People were congratulating each other as somebody found the party of their, their loved ones. That's the first time in my life somebody I have seen witnessed that. There was no mystery around the process. There was a policy provision, there was a legal imperative, and there was a manual process that said after 10 days, get rid of them. So when the RCMP came in after the fact and said, you know, we want access to your intercept material, in most cases, all we could show them was our intelligence report that, to the best of our ability, faithfully reflected what was on that tape, now erased. Somebody ought to have had that eureka moment and said, we have to stop doing this. It was a mistake, and it was a mistake that shouldn't have been made. Um, and we have acknowledged that. It shouldn't have happened. There's no joy that comes out of Air India and Arita. Not for anybody. So the next day was, of course, July 1st. They had made arrangements to bring my father to the airport, and I, I, I got on the plane, and he was loaded into the cargo. I remember watching him being loaded into the cargo, and I got on the plane, and they're celebrating July 1st, and everybody's happy, and they're, they were having, I remember the, the menu was lamb with mint jelly. That's what they were having. and. And I'm thinking, all these happy people, and here I am, this is the first flight, first airplane trip I've ever taken with my father, and I'm up here and he's in the cargo. It's the first father-daughter trip we've ever taken together. If I lose my husband, Am I still a wife? If I lose my children, am I still a mother? Who am I? To walk into that house and know that that bed will never be occupied by that person again. To go to their closets and feel their clothes and smell them. To go through your cookbooks and see that you're you're going through these recipes that were their favorites. To listen to a song that you knew was one of their favorites. What do you do with all that? You know? 
It's so full and so empty at the same time. family and a nice wife to go home to. They're not going home to their wife anymore. Like, that's not happening. What do you think should happen to people who do things like this? What do you think should happen to the people who did this? Tell me what you think. You, you know, that's really bad what happened, right? I, 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 I feel sad. What do you think should really happen to the people happened. that did this? They should be shocked. Thank you. 